Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Please be seated. Today is the last Sunday of ordinary time and the New Year's Eve of the church. It's also a day on which the church celebrates something we like to call Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday, we begin the short and yet beautiful season of Advent as we prepare our hearts for the infant king to be born into our lives once again. But every year we get to this point, as we begin that work of preparation, I find it terribly ironic and maybe even a bit amusing that some 2,000 years removed from the crucifixion, just as the people of Jesus' own time were confused about what it meant for Jesus to be king, I think we, too, have a difficult time figuring out just what it means for Jesus to have that title. I suppose part of the reason is how culture dictates and depicts who we think of as kings or who we think of as people of royalty. I saw two such instances just this week. The first instant came yesterday morning, in fact, with a cartoon that my boys were watching, Paw Patrol. You, you know that cartoon. And, and in the cartoon, the royal queen, she took advantage of some power that had come to her and ultimately caused chaos for the people of Adventure Bay. Naturally, the Paw Patrol had to come to the rescue. No problems too big, no puppies too small, right? <laughs> the second such instant came with all of the news surrounding King Charles. I'm sure many of you saw that. There were so many stories out there about how an archaic rule of the realm allows for the royal family to collect funds from those who die and don't have a will in place or any kin. I don't know much about how this system works, so I'm really not in a place to comment on it any further. But according to the stories that I read, I know there's groups of people upset about how the king and his family have used some of these funds. 
But I also know that King Charles is just about to transfer a significant amount of money into ethical investment funds as a way to potentially offset some of the damage caused by this archaic system. Even so, the news surrounding the issue has continued to propel and lift up the character of a king that we've all imagined since we were little children. One who sits on a crown, on a throne of royalty with a crown of jewels and uses their power, yes, sometimes for the good of the people, but oftentimes to benefit themselves. I have to think that this is no less different than what the people of Jesus' time imagined when they thought of a king, and not just imagined, but probably experienced as well. So to hear the words from Jesus, the Son of Man will sit on the throne of his glory, I can appreciate the confusion. And dare I say, the sudden feeling of hopelessness that those people felt when they heard those words and were told of yet another king and ruler to come. But we who have read through the biblical narrative, we who know the stories, we should be the ones to know better. You see, we should know that Jesus wasn't going to be the kind of king that was written by the victors of history. We should know that Jesus wasn't going to be the kind of king to come battle with the sort of destruction and violence, but the sort of righteousness and justice and integrity. We should know that Jesus would not only use his life to benefit all of those around him, but he would do so much good throughout his life. We know that the power that he had is all there on the cross. Otherwise, the cross that we lift up every Sunday has no power at all. And yet I wonder... If deep down in our hearts, we really believe all of that. Maybe our hearts would be more compelled to believe even more strongly if every day of our lives, we strive to do the things that Jesus commissioned us to do at the very end of this gospel. What is even more ironic than us failing to recognize Jesus as King is the question that I often get from newcomers to the faith and longtime churchgoers alike. Seldom they ask, what do we have to do to be more like Jesus? What do we have to do to be more like Jesus? You see the irony in that question, right? Think about the gospel text. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. It's all right there written in the good book. That's what we need to do to be more like Jesus. That's how we get through the eye of that needle, the camels that we are. And it's really that simple. I know it's simple because the gospel text tells us it's simple. Lord, when was it that we saw you doing these things and that we took care of you in this way? The people ask of Jesus and the king responds, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my own family, you did it to me as well. Jesus is lifting up the fact that when we care for each other, when we live by the promises that we make in our baptism, when we care for the human family in the way that this scripture tells us, we care for Jesus. And when we care for Jesus, we do as Jesus taught. And when we do as Jesus taught, we live as Jesus lived. And when we do that enough, it becomes second nature such that we don't even realize we're doing it because it's a way of life. It's a way of being. It's a way of continue, continuing to build up those pieces and parts of the kingdom that never will end. The kingdom we proclaim week in and week out right here. It really is that simple. Last Sunday, during our youth confirmation class, one of the youth asked us leaders, how do you know if the things written in Scripture are the right way to do things? How do you know if the things written in Scripture are the right way to do things? Good and faithful question and one that is actually long and difficult to answer, considering that when we look at Scripture, we're doing so much more than just reading the words right there on the page. But I think the simple answer is this. Well, it can take a lifetime to truly understand the Scriptures and sometimes what Jesus is asking of us. 
you simply live by the teachings of Jesus and you begin to find hope in your heart because you've caused positive change in someone else's life, then I think you can safely say that's the right way to be doing things. Because here's the truth. Belief can sometimes be a difficult thing to be had, especially given the darkness of the world. But doing, and doing in the ways of Jesus, that's really not that hard, is it? The irony of it is that the more you do, the easier it becomes for you to believe. And the more you believe, the more you do. I just love circular arguments and irony, don't you? Theologian Stanley Hauerwas once said that the difference between the followers of Jesus and those who do not know Jesus is that those who have seen Jesus no longer have an excuse to avoid the least of these. Those who have seen Jesus no longer have an excuse to avoid the least of these. Jesus is that kind of king that can compel that kind of lifestyle. That's the king that I want to follow. I hope the same is true for you. And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me as well. Amen. Your time, girl. (laughs) I invite the godparents and parents of little Cassidy to please stand up. The candidates for holy baptism will now be presented. We present Cassidy and Lynn Palmer to receive the sacrament of baptism. Will you be responsible for seeing that this child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? Will you, by your prayers and witness, help this child to grow into the full stature of Christ? I will, with God's help. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce him. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. Invite the congregation to please stand. This one's important for you, congregation. Will you, by your prayers and witness, help this child to grow into the full stature of Christ? We will. Let us join with this child who is committing themselves to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. Let us now pray for this child who is to receive the sacrament of new birth.
Deliver her, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. Open her heart to your grace and truth. Fill her with your holy and life-giving spirit. Keep her in the faith and communion of your holy church. Teach her to love others in the power of the spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send her into the world in witness to your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring her to the fullness of your peace and glory. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant, O Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and grace. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who here are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. I invite the parents and godparents to come forward, and the rest of the congregation, you may be seated. Come here, sweetheart. Oh, you're smiling. You ready for this, aren't you? Cassidy and Lynn, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, you did so good. You did so good. She's just soaking it all in. You like that microphone? Cassidy and Lynn, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. And finally, Cassidy and Lynn, receive the light of Christ that you might always remember to be a light in the world. Amen. Oh, she's reaching for you. You're so good. <laughs> Together, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit, you have bestowed upon us this your servant the forgiveness of sins and have raised her to the new life of grace. Sustain her, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give her an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, and the spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We receive you into the household of God, confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share in us with his eternal priesthood. I invite you to stand as you are able. My sisters, my brothers, my friends in Christ, and my newest little friend, <laughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. <laughs> 
Welcome once again, little Cassidy. We're so grateful to have you with us this morning. I know you're all ready for announcements and Thanksgiving basket, but if you look closely at your bulletins, we actually continue with the prayers of the people. The reason we jump into the peace during baptisms is that is the traditional way to welcome a newly baptized person into the church. So I thought, why not give Cassidy the welcome that grace can do? So we will continue with the prayers of the people, and then we'll jump into announcements and thanksgivings. In the life of Jesus Christ in our midst, we have known God's judgment and mercy. And in the glory of Jesus, we acclaim the image of God invisible. With the whole church, we turn to Christ this day, acknowledging that he alone rules in truth. As we say, when you come into your kingdom, remember us, O Lord. Jesus, Savior and Judge, you have confounded earthly judgment by choosing to be numbered among the transgressors. May your word comfort all who are in prison, all judged guilty by society and church, and all who live on the margins of the human family. When you come into your kingdom, remember us so. Jesus, condemned and powerless before your enemies, Grant to the leaders of people to know that their rule is in the service of greater law. When you come into your kingdom, Christ, firstborn of the dead, through the blood of your cross, you give unity to the divided. Give to the church the hope of resurrection. May we recognize the image of God in your own rising. When you come into your kingdom, Christ, image of the invisible God, free us from holding you in images of our own making. Grant that in the spirit, we may see all power and all life transformed by the compassion of the cross. On this day, we pray for all on our prayer list, including Kathy Michaels, Foster Ryan, Brad Brown, Sebastian Tebert, Eileen Hammers, Kanita Carter, Thea, Karen Jackson, Sherry Brunson, Aaron Tachita, Alfred Crane III, Douglas Rose, Gordon Reinstrom, Peggy Bruce, and those we name at this time. We also pray for all our partners in mission, especially for United Thank Offering, whom we are supporting with our Thanksgiving basket on this day. And we give you thanks for your abundant gifts, especially for all of our visitors, 
the baptism of Cassidy Ann Lynn, this parish family, the altar flowers which are given by David and Lynn Grimsley in celebration of their granddaughter Heather's birthday. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, Redeemer and lover of souls, may the dead who have partake, partaken of your chalice be with you in paradise. On this day, we pray for all of those who have died, especially for George Sage, J. Bruce, and those we name at this time. When you come into your kingdom, Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, through Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. And now we get to move on to the fun part. Good morning, Grace Church. Good morning. That was good. Thank you for coming on out on a rainy and Sunday morning, especially thank you to our visitors and our newcomers and our baptismal family. Uh, thank you for worshiping with grace. Uh, if you are a visitor or newcomer and you feel compelled to do so, please fill out a newcomer's card uh, found in your pew rack so we can know who you are and how best to serve you here at Grace and Beyond. Our vestry person of the day is Emma Morgan. Where's Emma? She's all the way in the back, waving her hand and smiling. Um, thank you, Emma, for being here. If you need anything after the service and you can't find me, please find Emma, and she will let me and the vestry know. Uh, after the service, I hope everybody wanders on over for some goodies in the parish hall and also Advent wreath making. There's also a few nativity scenes on display. Um, so go on over, enjoy some of the festivities, and have some fun and fellowship. Um, and there's also a cool little take-home activity that Nanette actually prepared for us to, to think about Advent as we go through the four weeks of Advent, starting next Sunday. Also next Sunday will be our fair trade market in the parish hall on Saturday and Sunday. It's in conjunction with all the activities going on on Main Street. If you find yourself up here, wander on over to the, to the parish hall. Everything that... Um, all the proceeds from the fair trade market go to outreach ministries here at Grace. Um, the bookshop will also be open, and I hope you can come and, and support those efforts. Uh, the people who work behind the scenes to make them happen do a really, really good job. So please come on out and support them. Also next Sunday, uh, I will be accompanying the youth on our annual Angel Tree Tag Shopping trip. So if you are a youth and you haven't RSVP'd to me yet, Please let me know by the end of today so I can make sure we have enough rides. Um, as you heard in the um, prayers of the people, our Thanksgiving basket for this day, as is our custom on the Sunday following Thanksgiving, is going to United Thank Offering, which is a ministry of the Episcopal Church that goes to support relief and need all across the world. It's a great organization, and so as always, I thank you in advance for your generosity. And last but not least, remember that we're adjusting our speed a little bit with coming up for communion. Just pay attention to uh, Steve, the usher, and he will get you up here. And, uh, and if you need help when you're up here with sipping or dipping or a blessing, just let me know and we'll make it happen. Um, and remember that this is the Lord's table, not the Episcopal Church's table. And all who wish to receive blessing or partake of the Eucharist are welcome to come forward. All right, William, you come, William's going to help us out with a Thanksgiving basket. Remember that everything that goes into this basket goes to United Thank Offering, and when the silver plates come around, that's for the needs of the church and beyond. got something so we just, I'm thankful for a great holiday with uh, my family and another adventure yesterday evening with uh, Debbie's family and uh, most of the kids. Ten kids all under seven. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I guess it's back to bring it. 
Tuesday, we were able to go to the Thanksgiving service at Zion and hear some um, good sermon. And it made me very thankful that we have him every Sunday. <laughs> because you should have heard the Haman and the Hallelujah and watching the bell fire just sit on their edge of their seat during that sermon. It made me so thankful to have him with us. As always, I'm thankful for you all, Grace Church, and your life and your love and your service that you give to this place we call Grace and Beyond. And on this week, I'm also thankful for the life of Jay Bruce, who we will be celebrating um, on Tuesday afternoon at 1 p.m. And if you find an hour during your busy work day, please come on out and help support Peggy and uh, lift Jay up as we, we lift him and love and give him back to God. St. Paul says, each of you should give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver.